Y'all done showed up. Y'all done showed up. Yeah, 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 yeah. Y'all done showed up. It's like Jalen Suggs at Half Court Shot last night or something. Or it's like Jesus didn't stay dead. It's also like that, Genesis Church. Hey, if you're new here, we're really glad you're here. Can we show our new friends some love, Genesis Church? All of our online family, come on, can we welcome them also? Glad you're here. My name is Josh. I don't know if I said that yet, but my name is Josh, and I get to pastor this church with my wife, Carly. We're really glad you're here. If you're part of our family, it's Easter, baby. We're about to do it. If you are joining, hanging with us, if you are in the area or you are online, got invited for the first time, and you're looking for a church, we'd love to have you. I don't know if you've ever had anybody volunteer to be your pastor before, um, but my wife and I, we would love to uh, be in your world as pastors and help lead and guide and shape and mold um, here in this house. We're a family. All the stuff that comes with family. Got some fun. Got some freaks. Got some weirdos. Just like your family. Tell the truth. Come on. Don't give me this Easter. <laughs> you got weirdos too. And here's the rule. If you don't have any weirdos in your family, it's because you're the weirdo. That's the rule. So that's me and my family. And uh, so you'll fit in really well around here. You found a house full of generous people who are exuberant and expressive and really love Jesus. And so we love to have you. Why don't you grab your seats? We're going to jump into scripture together today. Darling, you ready to hang with me again? Round two. Let's go. We love the Bible here at Genesis Church. Here's what you did not show up for. You didn't show up for a TED Talk. You don't need a TED Talk. What you need is the power of the Holy Spirit at work through the Word of God. That's what you need. And that's what God promises as we open His Word, that the Holy Spirit would lead us into all wisdom, that He would open the Scripture for us, that we would understand His life, His nature, His character. And so I'm not just here as a guy who's like, here's my cool thoughts on Easter. Go look for eggs. That's not why you came here. You came here to encounter the power of the Holy Spirit, the risen and Savior, and that's what happens when we open the word together. And so we holler back at this church preaching as a team sport around here. You're gonna hear people saying, Yeah, amen, get it. Someone might yell, Sogs, in the middle of the service. Who knows? Who knows? Better, that was a better one. Someone said, Jesus, that's a better one. Luke chapter 23. I got a question for us today on Easter. What are you looking for? What are you looking for? Luke chapter 23, verse 50. I'm actually gonna back up to 44. I didn't tell this to the team until just right now. So if it's not on the screen, that's my bad. Luke 23, 44. It was now about the sixth hour and there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. That's noon, our time, until 3 p.m. So at noon, it's not supposed to be dark at noon, yo. That's not, but from noon until 3, start. While the sun's light failed and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Then Jesus calling out with a loud voice said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. Verse 47, now when the centurion saw what had taken place, what are you looking for? When the centurion saw what had taken place, he, he praised God. The centurion, a Roman official who was tasked with carrying out Jesus' crucifixion, it wasn't a murder. I've seen a lot of stuff going around. It, was a murder. it wasn't a murder. If he was a man, it, it would have been a murder, but you can't kill God. Like he gave his life up. It wasn't a murder. Nobody took it from him. The more powerful thing is that he laid it down for you and for me. It was the greatest act of cosmic justice in the his. This was not an injustice. It was just. It was God executing covenant. He promised. When he cut covenant with Abram, he promised you and I that we would live in that blessing fully knowing that you and I could not uphold our end of the bargain, so he cut covenant with himself. And then the cross represented Jesus. It, it was the exclamation point on his earthly ministry and the greatest act of cosmic justice was exacted in that moment where God punished the sin of the world, past, present, future. And his son, Jesus. And it's in this moment, the veil is torn. The centurion sees it. And he says, certainly this man 
was innocent. And all the crowds that had assembled for this spectacle, what are you looking for? You're looking for a spectacle? When they saw what had taken place, they returned home beating their breasts. This was mourning and lamenting. Verse 49, all his acquaintances and the women who had followed him from Galilee stood at a distance watching these things. <clears throat> stood at a distance watching these things. What are you looking for? What are you looking for today? What are you looking for in life? What are you looking for in your world? Would you... Maybe you came here without any expectations. You weren't really looking for, for anything, but I would imagine there's something, if you ask yourself a question like deep down on the inside, there's something you're looking for, something. You're looking for joy, you're looking for peace, you're looking for wholeness, you're looking for, for someone to repay you something that's been to you. Look, you, what are you. What are you looking for? 23 verse 50 says, there was a man named Joseph from the Jewish town of Arimathea. And he was a member of the council. He was a good and righteous man. And he didn't consent. He had not consented to their decision and their action. What was their decision that Jesus had to be dealt with? And so they falsely accused him and they shamed him. And they went up that hill offering his life on the cross. And Joseph Arimathea was like, no, nah, he didn't consent. He didn't consent because he didn't know the end of the story. He didn't know that Jesus gave up his life. But I love this. He was looking for the kingdom of God. Oh, church, we would do well. You know what you can find? Faults in anybody. You can find, you, what are you, I've, I, I don't know about you, but I've, I've been pondering this cultural moment a lot and I'm, I'm, getting, I'm getting exhausted of living a life where I am, I'm, I'm living with the lenses of trying to find what's wrong with someone, what's wrong with what they said. What's, what's, where's that coming from? What's your motivation? Why would you say that? What are you trying to read? Like, like, if you're looking for faults in a person, in a system, in, you can find it. I promise. Because we're humans. Any institution built by humans, any relationship, anything that we build will have faults and flaws. But you know, I'll... I was just so, I felt a sense of relief when I read in this text that there was a man named Joseph of Arimathea who was looking for the kingdom. What if in our relationships, what if, what if the church of God, before the world tears yourself apart, the church of God was the place where we were looking for the, we were looking for the kingdom. We, we were trying when we were examining our relationships and examining our business partners and, and examining the world and examining the other side. If we were looking for, for the things in them that reflect the life and nature of God. Because we, we are imagers of God. Not, not, all, not everything about us images him to be sure because we're sinful. But I want to be, I want to be, Charlotte, I want to be like Joseph who's like, look, he's looking for the kingdom. He's got, he's got like heaven eyes. He's got kingdom eyes. Some kingdom. Mm. So here's what he did. He was look, since he was looking for the kingdom of God, it caused him to go do there's some action associated. And this man went to Pilate, Pontius Pilate, who was the governor of the, the region, the Roman official. And he asked for the body of Jesus. And he took it down and wrapped it in a in a linen shroud. This is verse 53. And laid him in a tomb cut in stone where no one had ever yet been laid. Joseph of Arimathea, having a place to be buried, having a tomb was an important thing for your family. It was a sign of wealth. I love that Joseph of Arimathea, looking for the kingdom, he gives something very valuable to Jesus, something that was probably for him. No, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go lay his body here. And it was the day of preparation and the Sabbath was beginning. Sabbath's sundown to sundown, Friday to Saturday. And the women who had come with him from Galilee followed and they saw the tomb and how his body was laid. They watched all these women who had been with Jesus from the beginning. They had broken bread with him. They were his friends. They had wept together over Lazarus' death. They had no doubt uh, uh, laughed together. They had seen Jesus perform miracles. They had, they had um, supported him. And they returned and prepared spices and ointments. This is what you would do for someone that you love in Jewish culture, not just Jewish, but 
specifically in this text, Jewish culture. And on the Sabbath, they rested according to the commandment. Chapter 24, verse 1 says, on the first day of the week. So you got Friday. As they're watching from a distance. Scripture says, the women who come from Galilee and all his acquaintances, they watched from a distance. The centurion was up close and he said, surely this man was innocent. His acquaintances, his friends, they're watching from a distance and they see it happen and, and they go home and the women immediately start preparing spices. They rest Saturday. Sunday morning, Sunday morning, Sunday morning, Sunday morning, Sunday morning. They wake up. Early dawn, they went to the tomb. They didn't waste any time. See, we know the end of the story, so you could say they, they, were, they, were, they were running to the tomb. They didn't waste any time because they wanted to see the resurrection, but they just wanted to take care of their dead rabbi. What a weird walk to that tomb that morning. How weird that walk must have felt. Still kind of reeling from the trauma of what had just happened, the disappointment, the just still kind of reeling, but like trying to make it work. You know, like like a lot of you. To process what just happened in, in the world, my life. Like these these were people who had been with Jesus from the beginning and they had, they had dedicated their lives to, to his mission and his ministry and his proclamation of the kingdom. It brought them to life on the inside. It, it lit something up in them such that, such that they, would leave their, they, they would leave their families and they would leave their, their businesses and they would, they would follow Jesus. And then the crucifixion. What? This was not in the plans. It wasn't supposed to happen this way. And so they go to the tomb, taking the spices that they had prepared. I just imagine this is like, it's just one foot in front of the other. It's like, this is what we know how to do. Like, I don't know, when I'm reeling from trauma, when I'm, when I'm reeling from like, bang, that's a major life injury. And you just kind of, you don't want to be the kind of person who just sits and does nothing and wallows. So you just kind of like, well, I guess this is what we do today. Like, I just, as, as I was reading through this text again, preparing this week, I'm just, I'm trying to process. I don't want to read too much into scripture, but I'm imagining if I, if I was walking that morning to that tomb, just still kind of like, like I had a day of rest, to worship, to spend time with my family, to share a meal together, but just like, what? What just happened? Verse two says, they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. The Holy Spirit spoke so clearly to me when I was reading that text that the hard part was over. The hard part, getting to Jesus, finding Jesus, the hard part was over. Friend, the hard part is over for you. You don't have to go find him. He came to you. The hard, the hard part is over. Whatever stone is separating you from Jesus is not from him. It's a stone which, which we rolled there, but, but they're there to be sure. You get some guy up here on Sunday and you do the thing, you go to church and this guy you've never seen before and the, the music's loud and the lights are there. It's like, why do you have a smoke machine? And so I tell you to Jesus, but you're like, bro, there's a, you don't understand. but my friend, the hard part is over. The, the barrier between you and Jesus has been rolled away, not by you, but by his sacrifice. What are you looking for? Are you looking for, and I say this with as much grace as I can muster, are you looking for a religion where you can punish yourself because you just you're just like I need to be punished are you looking for a place where you can look at a scripture and be like here's where you're missing it you're wrong you're wrong you're wrong, you're wrong. or 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 are you really down like deep down on the inside are you looking are you just longing for something anything that will bring freedom in your world and maybe maybe you haven't asked the question enough times asked why enough times to get down to the layer what am I actually looking for what am I really looking for I would venture, I guess, what you're really looking for is, is freedom and it's wholeness. 
and the hard part is over. This, when they got there, the stone, was, the stone was rolled away. Can you imagine them trying to roll away that stone to prepare the body of Jesus? The stone was rolled away. In verse 3, Scripture says, when they went in, they didn't find the body of the Lord. You know what they were looking at? A miracle. But you know what it looked like? A whole set of other problems. Not only did what they had prepared, the spices, I had all this stuff prepared, I was going to do this. I was, gonna, I was gonna take care of him because he meant so much to me. Now, not only can I not do what I was prepared for, we gotta find the body. Somebody done took the body of Jesus. And it was a miracle. Hey, this is what happens in, in our world sometimes though, that, that there's a miracle that's performed and because of the context we have, it just seems like a whole set of other problems got created. Maybe this is the miracle of, of following Jesus for you is that it's available, but you're like, man, I know what people say about Christians. That's a whole set of other problems that I don't even want to deal with. Okay, I get it. Let's keep reading the text. They didn't find the body. What are you looking for? What are you looking for? They were looking for a body. They, they found a miracle. What are you looking for? And in verse four, um, while they were perplexed about this, Perplexed is a common state of mind in scripture when you encounter the supernatural. Uh, what? Perplexed, it's perplexing. That's some of the power, that's some of the mystique, that's some of the mystery of it, is that you cannot explain it, you cannot recreate it. It's perplexing. Because it's so completely other. It's heavenly in nature. It's a nature that you were created to, to operate in and flow in. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by in dazzling apparel. I like like the ambassadors of heaven were dazzling. It's like Easter. We like, we like step it up in our wardrobe a little bit. People are like, who you try to impress? Uh, nobody. I just love bringing my best to God. Like, and then I see like the, I see like the heavenly dazzling a pair like I don't got anything dazzling put on put on your the most dazzling thing you got maybe it's got some holes got dirt but God here's my best I'm bringing you my best stood by in dazzling apparel and as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground the men said to them why do you seek the living among the dead what are you looking for adventure I guess like I said you're probably looking for some freedom looking for some wholeness maybe you could say you're looking for life I love Jesus says about himself in John chapter 10 verse 10 that he came that we might have life and life abundantly that you might truly be alive you're looking for the life Jesus is the life you're looking for the life but I, this, this, this is a stunning question. Why are you looking for the living? What are, you, what are you looking for? You know what's funny? They weren't looking for the living. They were looking for a dead body. They didn't know that they were looking for the living. What are you looking for? I love this. Even sometimes it, I think I'm looking for something and God shows up and gives me what I, what I, actually, what I actually need, what he's actually capable of of. I wonder how many miracles I have missed because, because I'm looking for something. And, and the angel is like, why are you looking for life in dead things? Church, this, this one's for the Christians in the room. We would do well to remember that the only thing that can bring life to us is the life, death, burial, and resurrection, ascension of Jesus Christ, the power of the Holy Spirit, anything else. And we got a lot of stuff right now. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna poke the bear. We got a lot of stuff right now that we're pointing people to before we're pointing them to Jesus, saying this, you're gonna find life here. This is the right way to do this, the right way to do life. Anytime we're pointing somebody to something before we're pointing them to Jesus, we're just trying to show them life among dead things. Those things only come to life, any system, any structure, any relationship. It only comes to life from the place of being empowered by the Holy Spirit, being brought to life in Jesus. So we would do well as the church to remember that the first place we point people is Jesus. I'm not saying 
Don't point them other places. I'm just saying, if you're pointing them there before you're pointing them to Jesus, the angel might have to ask you this question. Why are you looking for living among dead things? Verse 6, he's not even here. What happened to him? Oh, he did it. That's what happened to him. He has risen. And I love, I love what the angel has to say to them. Verse 6. Remember how he told you? Do you remember? Remember how, remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee? Verse 7. That the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified on the third day. Rise. And they remember. My question how do you forget that? Oh, right. How do you forget that? The guy that predicted his death, burial, and resurrection and then pulled it off. And they're like, he's not here. He's, he's risen. Remember how he told you? Remember how he said he was going to do this? And they're like, yes. That's right. But how easily we forget things that we once knew to be so true. Life beats it out of you, experience. You've seen too many things that seem to be contrary to this word. And do, do, you, do you remember what, and this, this has been part of my prayer this week is that you would, you would remember. You remember, you remember what, remember what Jesus said? Rochelle, remember how he said that, behold, I'll be with you to the end of the age? Remember, remember how he said that? Remember how he said, I'll never leave you, I'll never forsake you? Remember how he said, I will build my church and the gates of hell won't prevail against it? Do you remember? You remember how he, you remember how he said that? Oh yeah, I remember. Do you remember how he said that he, he made him who knew no sin to become sin, that you might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus? Do you remember? Do you remember you who are beating yourself up and holding things against you that God is not holding against you? Do, do you remember what he said? Do you remember? That you are now the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Do you, do you remember? Because you knew it once. Do you, but do you remember? Maybe, maybe you're here and you're like, I, I, I wouldn't consider myself someone who follows Jesus. Well, I'm, I'm going to hit you with a, uh, with a fourth century theologian named Augustine who argued that we all remember at a primal level, we all remember the Garden of Eden. This was his argument. There's something in us, breathed in us by the very breath of God exists. They called it at a primal level. We would say at a cellular level, at a DNA level. And there's something in us that remembers the garden. There's this wrestle in us to try and recreate the conditions of the garden, the provision, the protection, the fullness, the wholeness. There's something in us that remembers it at a primal level. And saying yes to Jesus brings you to life. Uh, you, uh, your dead spirit comes to life on the inside. And it's like on, it's like on Hook where the little kid, like, like Peter, who he was an attorney now, he forgot he used to be Peter Pan. And, 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 and the little boy, he does this with his face. He smiles again because you walk around like this because he's, he's an angry attorney. Not every attorney is angry, but he was in the movie. And he's like this. All the attorneys just get up and leave. I'm not saying you're angry if you're an attorney, but he wasn't. And he goes like this. And, and, then, he, and then the little boy says, well, there you are, Peter. And they go, oh, yeah, I do. I remember. They remembered his words. In the verse 9, returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the 11 and to all the rest. The 11 were the 11 remaining apostles, the 12 minus Judas. He had a rough weekend. thought that would be funnier, but it's kind of, it's Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles in verse 11, but these words seemed to them an idle tale. 
It seemed like a fairy tale. It seemed like a story. This can't, come on, this can't be true. And I love that it wasn't like Roman, like Romans who were not familiar with Yahweh. It wasn't, it wasn't like some people who had been to one of like Jesus' crusades on the, on the hillside. His apostles didn't believe it. Have you ever wanted something to happen so bad that when it didn't happen, you were just like, there's no way I could ever believe that this would be true again. You wanted him to love you so bad. So you walked down that aisle and you said yes, and, and then he didn't love you anymore hard and it was traumatic so you just like one foot in front of the other and then and then even if someone told you no 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 you're worthy to be loved you're like it's an idle tale they so badly wanted what Jesus said to be true that when it looked like it wasn't they couldn't even believe that it was even though they were also there when Jesus said hey guys I'm gonna die remember because Jesus says the son of man is gonna be delivered to the hands of sinful men to be offered up a sacrifice. And Peter goes, no, not today, Satan. And Jesus goes, get behind me, Satan. Peter's like, well, fine. I guess they'll kill me too then. Jesus is like, calm down, bro. They will eventually, just not right now. That's encouraging. Thanks, Lord. These words seem to them an idle tale and they didn't believe them. Some of you, someone up here talking about Jesus, the God man, fully God, fully man. We don't celebrate a man, we celebrate God in flesh. Because a man can't come back from the dead, but God can. You're like, this is this is cool, man. Thanks. Appreciate it. What are you looking for though? Really be brave. I know you're tough, but be brave. I'm not saying be tough, and I should be brave and ask yourself a hard question. What am I looking for? didn't believe him. Verse 12, I love this though. But Peter, oh, Peter. Peter, sweet Peter. I, I, can't, I can't wait to, to meet Peter. I hope he can make some time in his schedule in heaven to come over for lunch. I'm sure he's gonna be busy running something. Peter rose and ran to the tomb. There was still a high chance they would be killed. Let's not forget this. They had defied the empire. They had defied the religious establishment as well. But Peter's like, I gotta see. I gotta see. Eleven of them were like, I don't believe. But Peter's like, just gotta shoot my shot, man. Stooping and looking in, gets there. Just being seen here was grounds for him to be killed. And he like, I don't know if you can like close up in the camera. It's like looking in. And he saw the, he just sees the linen cloth by themselves. And he went home. He did it. He did it. Scripture says he went home marveling at what had happened. Like, oh. Part of my prayer for some of you in this room, since Peter rose and he ran, is that, is that the Holy Spirit would restore your run. Like, I used to run. So passionate. I'm not saying I'm not passionate anymore, but I can remember a time, there's moments where it was like, ah. it's like my son, he's four, he's got all this testosterone, he doesn't know what to do with it. So sometimes he's just like, ah, ah, ah. Like, yeah. Like, Peter, he, he rose and he ran. looked in there, I love this, there was no other people, no, 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 none of the women were there, no angels, none of the other apostles, no lights, no beautiful music playing behind the guy with the microphone, none, it was just Peter and an empty
52. And he looks in, he goes, my God, he did it. He did it. He did it. Church, he did it. He went home marveling at what had happened. John tells us this account 10 days later because we know Peter saw the empty tomb, but he hadn't seen Jesus yet for 10 days. Scripture says Jesus waited 10 days. He revealed himself to a bunch of the apostles, but there were three of them, Peter, James, and John, but he waited 10 days. Why? We'll have to ask him. Seems like a jerk move, but you can ask him someday. Waited 10 days. And then he's walking along. Jesus is at the end of the gospel of John. Jesus is walking down the seashore. Peter and James and John, they were sitting in a room hiding and Peter's like well I guess we'll go fishing today or something he's just kind of still reeling from so it's like one foot in front of the other you know like a lot of us just kind of kind of reeling from it's been it's been a long year and and Jesus comes walking up the seashore and he yells at him he's like hey have you guys caught anything and they just see a guy they don't know it's Jesus and they go no and Jesus is like I imagine Jesus in his head be like watch this and then he goes, hey, throw your nets over the other side. Have you tried throwing your nets over the other side? And Peter goes, I think it's him. Because that's what happened when Jesus first called Peter. I think, I think it's him. And he like takes off his jacket, jumps in the water and swims over. as this beautiful Jesus cooking up some fish. Seriously, read the text. He's got some fish sitting on a fire. I'm not kidding, it's there. Jesus and Peter just chopping it up, eating some fish sticks. And he says, Peter, do you love me? He's like, yeah, you know, I love you. Feed my sheep. I mean, Peter, do you love me? Yeah, Lord, you know I love you. Feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? You know I love you. Feed my sheep. It's this beautiful moment of restoration of Jesus reigniting purpose on the inside of Peter. I think those are moments that help Peter remember. Do you remember? Do you remember what he said? Do you remember what he said? That he would be delivered, the Son of Man would be delivered up to be crucified. Do you remember? And they go, I feel so silly, Mr. Angel, but I totally forgot that. And But now I remember. Yeah, Mr. Angel, what's his name? Uh, doesn't say. It was one of them. For as you to remember. Seems like an idle tale, but that you would remember. If, you, if you're someone who calls on Jesus as Lord and Savior, that you would remember what he said. He would be with you. Behold, I'll be with you until the end of the age feeling alone yeah but he said I'll never leave you alone I'll never forsake you and like well what do you mean Jesus you ascended to heaven yeah 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 but but God is still with you in the person of the Holy Spirit he's still with you what he said about you is that you are you're the head and you're not the tail that you're above and you're not beneath that because of what Jesus did what Romans tells us because of what Jesus did you are more than a conqueror you're not just a regular conqueror like in your own strength, but because of what Jesus did, you are more than a conqueror, more than an overcomer, one translation says. So, so just remember. I pray that you would have eyes like Joseph of Arimathea, that you would, you would be looking for the kingdom. What are you looking for? Are you looking for faults? You're going to find them. Looking for problems? You're going to find them. Don't look too close at me. I got faults, problems. I'm crazy up here, bro. You looking for the kingdom? find it maybe if you if you're someone who doesn't call on Jesus as Lord and Savior my prayer is that you would be brave to ask yourself a question what are you looking for what am I actually look all this posturing all this stuff that car I just bought that I don't even need like what what am I looking for that's a brave that's a big boy question what am I looking for all these hookups like what am I looking for what am I hoping I'm going to find at the bottom of that bottle? What am, I, what am I looking for? 
and that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you would remember who you were created to be, full of life and abundant life in Jesus' name. Can we stand together? I wanna pray over us, Genesis Church. I hear you on rattle. I hear you on rattle. Dun, dun, dun. Oh my gosh, should we close this sucker out with rattle? How much time do we have before next service? We should. We're gonna pray. We're gonna pray. We're gonna pray. We're gonna pray. Father, I'm thankful that you sent Jesus to die for us. Holy Spirit, let this never just be an Easter that we walk through, that we move through, that we just do the thing and we raise our hand and we sing the song. Help us remember Jesus, the perfection of your life, the perfection of your sacrifice, the perfection of cosmic justice that was exacted in the person and the work of Jesus, the fulfillment of covenant, not a murder, not a cover-up, not an injustice. Jesus, you laid your life down. They could not take it from you. And you gave it for us that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Let us remember in Jesus' name. If you're here today and you would say, Pastor, I wouldn't consider myself somebody who follows Jesus. We're gonna pray because the kingdom of God is here. And the kingdom is both proclamation and invitation. We proclaim with John the Baptist who said, repent and receive. Repent of your sins for the kingdom of God is at hand. It's what Paul says in Acts chapter 18 in Athens where he says there was a day where it was totally fine to just flow through your life. But now that the kingdom is here, we must repent and receive. It's proclamation, but also invitation into a kingdom that is wild, bro. It's upside down. The first will be the last. The, the, the least will be the greatest. If you want to be the greatest of all, you got to learn to be the servant of all. This is the, the adventure of a lifetime coming alive on the inside and discovering for the entirety of this life who God made you to be in his image. So if you're saying, yeah, if, if you maybe you have been pondering that question, what am I actually looking for? And the Holy Spirit just crafted this sermon for you. Yeah, I am looking for life and wholeness and fullness. And we're gonna pray. We're gonna, we confess our sins, we repent, and we receive the perfect gift of Jesus. And I'm gonna ask each of us in this room, each of us online, who maybe you've prayed something like this before, I'm gonna ask us to pray out loud with them and join our faith with theirs. Because if you're saying yes to Jesus, this is a big moment, it's a big faith moment. It's, it's gonna change your life if you let it. If you walk this out with us, like I said at the beginning of this, we're a family. We're a weird family, but it's, you're used to that. And we love to have you. So if you're praying this for the first time, or maybe the first time again, maybe today represents a rededication. I'm, I am remembering. I'm remembering. I would ask you to just incline your heart to the Father and pray in sincerity. I know there's stuff, there's music, there's this stuff going on. But just like Peter, you in an empty tomb, just... Pray in sincerity. Pray together. Let's pray out loud. Say, Father, thank you for sending Jesus to die for me. I know that I've sinned and I need you. Come into my world. Be my leader. Be my Lord. Make me brand new. Give me a fresh start. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and use my life to build your kingdom in Jesus' name. Come on, amen, Genesis Church. Come on, that's new life.